Hello. Good morning, everyone. I actually am supposed to have 20 minutes for this, and I believe it's five minutes till break. So I think I'm going to invade your break, if that's all right with you. Fine, people. Thank you. <laughs> so um, my writing exercise is basically pulling this all together and developing your first draft. Um, what I did was write about being a gymnast in my younger years. So what I felt that uh, needed to be done at the beginning of my, when I was having my speed writing thing, is that I needed to explain to people kind of how bizarre it was that I'm a gymnast. Because as you can see, I do not have a gymnast body. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of important to get into that as, and to make that vivid, using the vividness, just by writing and just how do we portray that. So I talked about being a tall gymnast and how I actually had some kind of natural ability. And you know that was kind of the beginning point that I started with at my speed writing that I actually held over and, and it developed a little bit more for my first draft. So I talked about how the uneven parallel bars were particularly daunting for me and that I had to, had to adjust them very, very wide because I was so tall. So we were always having to adjust the bars. And my coach would always tell me to not put my hands on the actual bar, to put your hands on the framework. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I know what I'm doing. So I put my hands on the bar. The bar proceeded to slip as it should do. That's what it's supposed to do. And sliced my finger open. So then, of course, my pride was hurt. I didn't want to let her know that I had um, sliced my finger open. Actually, I didn't even know that I had sliced my finger open. So I put the bar back up with my hand, my finger out for some reason. My body just did that, um, protecting itself, I suppose. And um, my coach said, what is that? And I looked at it, immediately began wailing. Just could not contain myself, because it was apparently the most painful thing I'd ever experienced in my entire life. Um, so then we had to wait for my mom to get there because we had already been after hours and whatnot. And we went to the emergency room and it's all about, you know, getting the stitches and seeing, seeing the doctors do that and the ultimate goal, the ending, which actually did not come in my speed writing. It came after we, after I thought about it a little while and went into the outline process and all that. So why don't we show the outline? So, again, we started with what I realized was, like in the speed writing part, I did not introduce like why I was suddenly 10 years old and didn't know how to adjust a bar, because usually gymnasts start when they're five so they can stunt their growth. Um, that's my own personal theory. <laughs> Even, yes, I am a doctor. Um, uh, so the school did have a new gymnastics program and I had tried out for it and I thought about that as I was doing the outline. So I was thinking maybe we should begin there and that would be a good starting point. So this all happened at the school gym and again I talked about my natural ability versus my physique. Um, then adjusting the parallel bars and the dichotomy between the coach's advice and what I actually did. Um, and then during the injury in my speed writing, I actually said something like, I immediately forgot all sense of embarrassment, all sense of propriety, and all sense of pride when I saw my, um, well, actually when I was readjusting the bar, when I was pulling it back up. And then I realized, basically what that means is my ego was hurt. So in the spirit of conciseness, I just made it my ego was hurt. So that just helped you know, bring it all together without all the verbose, many, words and lots of syllables, which we think makes us sound smart, but just continues to bore the reader. So in the spirit of conciseness, I figured out that that's really what I was trying to say. Um, began wailing. And then in the ER, I was, I, there was one point that was very salient to me. It doesn't really have anything to do with the story, but it was, was such a big memory for me that I kept it through the speed writing, through the outline and through the first draft, which may or may not be the right thing to do. And I've made some nice mistakes for you in the first draft, so you, we can see the mistakes and the, um, the, real, the way we should really do it. But I remember the doctor asking me if it was throbbing, and I had no idea what he meant by that, or the nurse asked me that. And I described it as my heart feeling like it was in my finger, which actually is the definition of throbbing. And I thought it was very professional for, for knowing that. <laughs> but I had no idea what she was talking about. But it was very, a very salient part of the memory for me. Um, and then, you know, I watched this, the stitching process happen. And uh, 
you know, that was part of, that actually led me to my ending that I found as I wrote the first draft. The details that I did not put in the actual outline that were in the speed writing exercise were that my coach was looking at her watch. You know, I don't even know if that's true. I just, I just wrote that during the thing because I said, I suppose that that could be true because it was after hours and we were waiting for my mother and whether or not that was true and it was irrelevant, so I just took it out. Um, I also talked about getting to know the ER very well during my gymnastics period. <laughs> also irrelevant, and had, unless I was going to go into the other things that happened during that time, there was no reason to mention it. Um, and then I said something about not crying, which didn't seem relevant to the actual telling of the story. It's an, it's an emotional uh, drive, but it didn't seem emotional to the relevant, um, to the emotional drive of this particular story. So I really like this exercise because it gets you thinking about truths, which is what I feel storytelling really is. It's all ultimately about truth and authenticity. You can find, if you can find the emotional stakes in your story, other people will relate to that. And the more relatable your story, the better the experience for the audience. It's more likely they will be transported into the world that you have created. I think of story, well, I got this as a quote from somewhere, but it's as the truth of the world wrapped around an emotional experience, which I just love that quote. It has the ability and it should complicate simple, I mean, communicate simple truths and reflect the dimensions of the human soul. And that's where stories come from. And that's why creativity with um, Sandra's slide can be so scary because you're dredging up these things and trying to tell the truth about your existence and the truth about humanity. And you're putting that in story form. And in order for someone else to feel emotional, it's also going to feel, it's also going to dredge up something in you. So that's why it can be very scary sometimes to just tell the truth. And that's why some people, I think, will avoid that and try to make up things and try to make it better when, in, in essence, it's not making it better. It's just adding on. And if you just find that truth underneath it, then that's going to be your story and that's what's going to connect with people. So stories are coming from the truth and from the soul. So basically, I'm saying they're coming from everywhere your friends, your own experience, your, um, your parents' lives. I always tell people to, when I meet them to watch out when they're telling me stories because whatever they tell me can end up on Grey's Anatomy, so watch out. So let's go to my first draft. What I'm going to do is not just read down my first draft, but kind of go through it and talk about storytelling or story structure as we go through it and try to hit on some of these points that we um, talked about. This one? No, it's the story. Oh, well, should I, should I talk about that? No, <laughs> just go back to the, okay, that's it. So I'm just gonna go through and read off bits of it and we'll talk about how that, talk, how that deals with some of the uh, four tools that we've learned today. So growing up, I tumbled everywhere, completely unsupervised, in my yard, on the street, in the pool, anywhere I could be upside down, I was. So in the fifth grade, when my elementary school hired a new coach and wanted to start a gymnastics program, I jumped at the chance to try it. So as you know, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I chose this beginning, like I said, to try to tell people how or why I was doing this gymnastics thing and trying to set the tone for the piece. Um, for clarity's sake, one of the toolkits. This piece will be about gymnastics. So we know that from the beginning. Um, as far as vividness, I feel, I feel like you can almost picture this kid tumbling everywhere. So you kind of get a sense of who this character is. You're introducing this first character. She, in this case, is the protagonist, which is the lead character that the audience will be rooting for. So you're going to be, you want a character that your audience is going to want to accomplish their goal. Like, you're going to establish their goal, and hopefully the audience will want them to, be, to, uh, to figure that out. One good question to ask at the beginning is, why now? Why are you telling the story now? This question is going to fuel your story. The reason I'm starting at this point in my life is because it gave the motivation for my story. Um, I already knew I was talking about a memorable health experience. So where do you start the story? Do I start the story when I started elementary school? No, that's too far back. Did I start the story of when I was born, a poor kid in Stockton, California? No. <laughs> Nobody cares about that for this particular story. Um, so that helps you with the key word of focus. So you're going to try to focus your story. Again, start as late as possible. 
so that you know, you're coming in to some action. OK, so going on, as most people know, gymnastics gymnasts are not the tallest of people. As a 10-year-old fifth grader, I was the tallest of all fifth graders. I had been the tallest person in all my classes throughout my academic career. Not exactly the normal physique for a gymnast, but I had a natural ability. I easily made the, the team. Again, people are not going to be seeing me to see that I am not a natural gymnast physique. So I have to describe that. I have to try to make that vivid. It's also developing the character. It's a relatable experience because everyone feels awkward in these kind of preteen years. Um, it's hard to fit into elementary school sometimes. And you might root for this character because she's human. She's sharing a human, truthful experience. And she went on despite the odds against her. So that might be the rooting interest for this character. So going on, because of my height, most of the apparatus seemed, had to be adjusted more than usual to fit me. The unleavened parallel bars was no exception. It was a particularly hard event for me, my least favorite, because I actually had to work, work at it, unlike beam, vault, or floor. Again, more character development, awkwardness. It introduces the goal that I was trying to master the daunting uneven parallel bars. So now we have a goal. We have a character and we have a goal. Um, we'll go on. So my coach offered to stay a little later one day to help me with my routine and do some basic moves. Now I've introduced the, the antagonist. OK, she's not really the antagonist because she didn't mean to make me slice my finger. She actually had the best of intentions. But in this story, where the antagonist and protagonist are going to go head to head in a battle of win or lose, which is kind of the definition of story, um, this lady was trying to tell me something that I was going to fight. So she is my antagonist. Um, the antagonist's purpose is to keep the main character from easily getting to A to B. So you always want to have some conflict, um, even though in this case it was completely unintentional. <laughs> so going on, it was just that she and I were doing some last minute tricks. We went to adjust the bars, me on one side, her on the other. She told me to be sure and hold the framework, not the bar itself, for safety reasons in case the bar slipped. Blah, blah, blah. I'm 10. I know what I'm doing. I thought, I, I thought to myself as I grabbed the bar. So this introduces the problem or the message. For you guys, that would be like the message. Um, that's me not listening to my coach. Uh, I feel like that was kind of a vivid description. You could kind of picture us on each side of the bar. And hopefully, we'll help the audience picture what's going on, since it's better, as Chris said, to show and not tell. It's important to try to integrate the message into the action as much as possible and avoid exposition. You want to try to dramatize the exposition. So in order to kind of say, uh, these were the rules that she set. I dramatized it by being a 10-year-old and thinking like a 10-year-old and hopefully trying to pull the audience in a little bit. Um, so you want to try to not wag your fingers as much as possible at the audience. I love this quote by Orson Welles, judge not lest ye bore the, the audience. <laughs> um, you want to keep your audience engaged. And this also introduces conflict, which is very, very, very important in storytelling. This is what keeps characters from easily reaching their goal. Um, if I had adjusted the bars and it had gone smoothly, there'd be no story. It's like if Bond killed the villain in the first 10 minutes. There's no movie. You need to know that Bond is going to have you know, obstacles. He's going to have a plan that he gets through. You already know that he's going to. He never dies at the end of the movies. But we always go. Or I do. <laughs> and it's because you want to know how he's going to get through these goals. How is he going to resolve his conflicts? Um, there, without conflict, there is no story. And again, I love this quote, conflict is the story, what sound is to music. Without conflict, there is no story. And even in Sarah's clip, you know, I mean, the conflict was an inner conflict. It was, do I tell my daughter what's really going on, and the daughter challenging him. So even in the emotional basis, there's, there's going to be conflict. Is it too easy for your character to get to their goal? Then raise the stakes. That's what's going to keep the audience engaged. OK, so it's going on. About five seconds later, the bar slipped, exactly what my coach had been worried about. My hand went down with the bar. My coach was immediately concerned. You all right, she asked. Of course I'm all right. I'm 10. I know what I'm doing. The only thing hurt was my pride. I began to lift the bar up with my left pinky sticking out for some reason. Then I saw it. There was an open, gaping wound. I sliced my finger wide open. Again, this goes with um, Chris's talk about the normal rhythm of life, you want to keep that rhythm. So there's ups and downs, there's ebbs and flows, there's, you know, it goes climax, excitement. Your, your story should kind of follow that lead. It's not all one emotional level. 
Um, as soon as I saw it, pride went out the window. I began wailing like a crazy person and holding my hand like I'd suddenly lost all use of it. Since it was after hours, the school nurse no longer was there. So we wrapped it in a towel and waited for my mother, who was actually on her way from her second job to her first and had to completely rethink her night because of unplanned events. So these are obstacles to get to their goal. I almost took this part out, but I felt that it was kind of an obstacle because if I just went and got it done, then, you know, where is that? Where is the goal there? Where's the obstacle there? Um, so it's just about being a glitch. And if I had it to do again, I think, like, and you would have it to do again because writing is rewriting. This is a first draft, and there's, there's second drafts, there's third drafts, there's eighth drafts sometimes in writing. Um, there's, a, there's this little detail that I had about watching these little white pustules on my, on my finger, which I decided were white blood cells. Um, because apparently, I just studied that in school or something. And so I just decided that that was there. And had I, if I rewrote it, I might move that to this point. And maybe, I can't remember exactly where that happened in the real story, and maybe that's not quite the truth. I'm not sure when I saw these things. I put them when I was in the hospital. I put that, that beat when I was in the hospital. But sometimes just twisting the truth just a teeny bit to make your story work can actually help the story. As long as it doesn't change your message or change the right way to do things. I don't know if you write Grey's Anatomy, but we do that a lot. <laughs> um, things can, you, but the thing is, you can take truth or character and condense it, heighten it, or accelerate it. Um, things can ha happen in less time than in real life. Things can happen out of order if it doesn't mess up the, the message. Things can be bigger or grosser than it is in real life. And that just helps fuel your story and make it interesting. But you know, always the truth is, can be stranger than fiction. And sometimes you can't even use the truth because it's too strange. So <laughs> you have to make it actually relatable to your audience and make them not want to say, that could never happen. Um, hours later, we made it to the emergency room. It wasn't too crowded, but when my, I saw my finger, they immediately took me back and began asking questions. The question I most remember is, is it throbbing? I had no idea what throbbing meant. For some reason, though, I answered with, it feels like my heart is beating in my finger. That seemed to satisfy the nurse enough to let the doctor start to fix it. Again, I think this is probably an unnecessary fact. And when I rewrote it, when I rewrite it, if there was some sort of uh, press on time or press on length or something like that, it might be one of those babies that I kill. <laughs> I love it's this okay. this detail, but it may not be necessary. It, it does not necessarily forward the story. It's kind of a holdover, um, but it, it does. It's fun because it's vivid and it's it's a it's a it's an interesting fact. Um, so you want, and it also helps kind of develop the character. You want your character to be as much as possible revealed through action. So this is kind of like this, this 10 year old maybe has a little bit of knowledge that she doesn't know, you know. So you're kind of a little bit revealing this character through action. Um, again, in Bond, you know that he is, uh, let's see. Other Bond characters never tell him, you're so cool that you shoot bad guys and get out of horrible, dastardly plans. He just does. You just know that he will do that because you've shown that through action. We see him do it. There's no need to actually put that in exposition. Um, just finishing this out, as they put my left arm out straight, I decide to examine the wound closely myself. Little white circles had formed in the edges that and I must have learned about white blood cells recently because that's what I decided those were. So that's where I put it in the actual first draft. Again, I might move that up in, in, the, um, in the second draft. And writing is rewriting, which is an old adage that we always say. Writing is rewriting. You, you keep going. Your first, your first draft is not going to be, it's better than your vomit draft, but it's not going to be your final draft. Um, and this also helps to paint the picture with words, which helps with the vividness that we talked about. And lastly, my hand was basically at eye level as a doctor walk, worked on it. So I watched as they cleaned it out and put, put, the, put in the needle multiple times to, to numb it up. Then came time for the stitches. The second, this, this seemed pretty gross to me, so I turned my head. The doctor told me I'd already been through the hardest part, so I might as well keep watching. It actually didn't take a lot of convincing before I turned my head back to watch as all 11 stitches were painlessly entered into my finger. It was pretty fascinating. It might even be one of the key reasons I'm a doctor today. Now this part at the end was the part that I found in the first draft. This became, I realized that I needed an ending and I didn't have one. And I realized as I was writing that this is one of the experiences that made me fascinated with medicine. And watching the stitches go in and you know, seeing the doctor 
cure me. So I felt like this was a really good place to end and a really good way to pull it all together. Um, in your ending, you want to say, like, why did I tell the story? In this case, it was the one event on my, in my life that set me on that path. And I never adjusted the bars that way again. So, so are we going to yeah. have them? No.